Chairman, dear listeners, colleagues, uh, on the South Transnubian Water Management Directorate, it is my great pleasure to present one of our uh, finished projects, namely the morphological monitoring of the Drava River uh, sediment study. Uh, at first, uh, I would like to show uh, the operation area of our directorate. It uh, consists uh, those uh, area, which is uh, 10,000 square kilometer long, and consists namely Baranya, Shomoy, and Tolna County. Our company is uh, task uh, focusing on mainly the management uh, task, uh, such as uh, flood protection, water recourses management, uh, catchment management, monitoring, public water services, watershed control, hydrogeographic uh, management, uh, undrained water runoff uh, protection, ship voyage assignment. Uh, and also we are focusing on the expertise as, as it is um, in the state of EU administrative works, standards and services. Uh, on the first uh, picture you can see one uh, flood uh, event, uh, what was happened in 2010, basically in the downtown of Pécs. Uh, Pécs is located in the southwestern part of uh, Hungary. On the second picture you can see also water damages in a small catchment. Uh, on the third picture, you can see the Danube River in last year. Uh, in Hungary, along Hungary, exceeds uh, one of uh, the biggest uh, floods that have been ever measured. And uh, I would like to give one other example of our managed uh, river, uh, which is also focused the project, the Drava River. And those picture was taken one month earlier. It was also the, close to the highest water. It was uh, just only eight uh, centimeter less than the highest uh, water was. Uh, our directorate uh, is a 20 kilometer long flood levee on the Danube side, you can see, and we have also more than 87 kilometer long flood levee on the Drava. You can see the whole Drava section. It consists uh, basically two uh, different uh, sections along Hungary. And now about the project. Uh, you can see uh, the with the red uh, dots uh, the five uh, different uh, station settlements, namely Botovo, Bélavár, Barcs, Drava, Szabolcs, and Belisce. And those uh, two settlements, those two sections, uh, were uh, basically uh, the measurements. Uh, the whole section was uh, 270 kilometers long. And... Uh, uh, there was uh, the suspended uh, load, the bad load, and bad materials uh, sampling in situ measurements in our directorates. Uh, and you can see uh, the different measurements. And I would like to show uh, one graph uh, that was uh, measured in Botovo. The bot in Botovo section, the average value has uh, significantly decreased. But uh, it uh, supposedly, because of the, it started in that time, it was basically, I think, in 2010, uh, new uh, hydropower plants in uh, Donia Dubrava. And it has uh, such a deep uh, impact of the sediment uh, setting. Uh, but in Barge, the average value has increased approximately uh, 30%. Uh, percent. And uh, in the other section, the Rava, Savoc, and Latania did not change. And why did it change? Uh, the, we have uh, big problems with the suspended uh, load uh, because of uh, the longitudinal transport. transport um, we cannot avoid that one. And the reason is uh, because uh, the river is, the distance of the river is uh, shortening. And uh, as I mentioned before, the hydropower plants has also sh such a deep uh, impact of the riverbed sinking. Uh, in Hungary, the gravel mining, the gravel excavation now uh, stopped. It's not allowed, uh, but as far as I know, that uh, it's still available in, in the other countries along the Drava. Um, the solutions, what can be? Uh, we have to have uh, such a, a deep and close uh, dialogue uh, on the national level, so we have to have uh, a national cooperation uh, because the hydropower plants cannot be uh, closed. Maybe 
we can start to do a dialogue between the other countries and uh, to modify how it works, the hydropower plants. And maybe it also can be one solution to uh, do the longer uh, reverse section for, for the drama. And the conclusions of uh, the study need to establish the fixed control sections, need to carry out repeated measurements during the flat condition, and longer data series are needed for all of the stations. Uh, you can see with the purple lines, uh, the first measurement was have been in 1974, and um, that was on that graph, uh, the newer uh, measurement. It was made in uh, 2011. And you can see it in the barge section, and you can see the differences uh, between the two lines, and it's about uh, four or three uh, centimeters per year, the river bed sinking in the average value. And I'm open if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Laszlo. That was nicely fitting to the five minutes barrier. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Sally German. I'm, I'm a geomorphologist. I work for Arup, which is an en engineering consultancy, and I'm, I'm based in Leeds in the north of England. Um, I'm just going to talk about a project that we did for Yorkshire Water, which is a water supply company based in the north of England. And they own 147 reservoirs that are used for drinking water supply. And many of these are over 100 years old, and, and quite a lot of them have no formal compensation flow downstream because of the infrastructure of, of the reservoirs themselves. So under Water Framework Directive, Yorkshire Water are tasked as the asset owners um, with bringing all the water bodies where they're responsible for failure of that water body due to their asset back into good ecological potential by 2027. <coughs> so with a lot of these schemes, because, because of the lack of compensation flow, it's low flows that are an integral reason for many of these failures. Um, but the value of drinking water is too high um, to justify putting um, flow down the river in most of these cases. And um, achieving good ecological potential on um, 12 water bodies that Yorkshire Water are responsible for with low flow issues has potentially a, a £30 million water resources cost. So an alternative mitigation measure to achieving WFD compliance is to use river restoration to modify the channels and adjust the geomorphology to reflect the, the regulated flow. Um, and river restoration can be delivered for a fraction of the cost of the traditional um, water resources solutions. Um, but Yorkshire Water need a certain amount of sort of assurance that, that the schemes will work and that they'll actually deliver um, WFD compliance. And so these projects, um, uh, Yorkshire Water are trialling two projects to determine the potential for adopting this alternative technique. Um, and my poster presented the results of one of these projects, which is downstream of the Swinsty Reservoir, which is on the River Washburn. So just in case people aren't quite sure where, where we are, there's, there's leaves up there, and, and um, the Swinsty Reservoir um, is, is up here. Um, that's, that's the down wall of the Swinsty Reservoir, um, and this is the site here. This is a rebel, River Washburn. Um, the Washburn um, eventually drains into the Humber, which is one of the largest um, catchments in, in, um, in England. So this, this is what the river looks like at the moment. Um, there's, as I say, there's very little flow. The water's pretty stagnant. And in the summer, you can quite often see fish sort of flapping around, trying to, trying to move, but they just get stuck in, in some of the very old pools that still exist there. There's um, extensive overshading with over 100 trees in the 800 metre reach that we were looking at. Um, all of the, the medium and coarse gravels have been stripped from the bed during higher flow events that do happen when the reservoir overtops. But because there's no um, sediment supply coming downstream, that, that those sediment sizes aren't, aren't replenished. 
And so the bed is dominated by cobbles and, and, um, and boulders and, and just very fine material. So as, as a consequence, there's very poorly defined geomorphological features, so the habitat quality is really poor. And as a result, you've got an over-wide channel with, with very shallow flows. So we were tasked to look at how we could, how we could change this, how we could implement um, some form of river restoration which would improve this. And this started off as one of our sort of concept designs of this is what we'd like to achieve in an idealistic world with um, narrower, narrow channels, defined geomorphological features, gravel bars that functioned, um, and there, that there was some, some movement of gravel through the system, but it needed to be designed in a way where there was some dynamic process going on, but the features themselves were also quite static because there was no continuing sediment supply. Um, and um, So there, there were a number of solutions that we adopted in the end um, through um, importing gravel um, and the use of existing trees that line the bank um, to create the former ledges of the features. Um, and, but we needed to ensure that those features stayed in place. So there's, there's a number of different techniques here that we've got. Um, trees um, lining the edges of, of, um, of bars here. There's another tree that's, been, that's, that's fallen over here which, where the root ball is still there to try and catch, catch sediment as it comes down. These trees here have been put in to, to encourage scour in this area and create a pool feature and maintain that pool feature so it doesn't just get filled up. Um, there's a fixed riffle here to try and make, um, retain some of the gravel that's, that's in the system. And again, um, a tree that's been lined here in a different way. Some of the material for the bars will be imported um, from an outside source. And then other material will just be redistributed from, from the channel itself to, to create these formal features. So on site, it, the, the marking where all these features were was, was quite a challenge. Um, and we used, we actually walked along the river and, and marked out all the trees that we were going to use and, and surveyed the locations of where all the geomorphological features that we wanted to create were, were, were going to be placed. Um, and then it was then marked up in this more formal um, engineering design to allow the, um, the contractors to, to cost it up. Uh, at the moment, the contractors have got the drawings in there and they're pricing it up and, um, and hopefully the scheme will be built within the next six months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. My name is Krzysztof Szoszkiewicz and I come from Poznań, Poland. And uh, yeah, maybe I will, uh, yeah, this is a title and I, I will use my poster presentation okay and uh, yeah I would like to introduce you our study was uh, uh, took into consideration the this uh, river system these are two rivers each one about uh, 30 kilometer and this river system uh, was uh, uh, taken into consideration as to uh, to uh, for uh, restoration uh, we haven't got many many uh, uh, restoration measures in Poland, but it is managed by the forestry company and they uh, uh, wish to, to develop the more uh, sustainable way of, of forestry, including the, uh, the uh, uh, river system close, closer to nature. So uh, in this river system, we propose a lot of measures. So the uh, yeah, we uh, our our uh, uh, proposals were in the beginning were limited. So we didn't plan to rely the uh, the whole uh, river system. Uh, we just uh, tried to initiate uh, some fluvial processes. But even so, the the list of uh, potential 
uh, measures was too long for for uh, resources uh, the the forestry company would like to spend for this. So we tried to select the um, uh, the uh, 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 sites which were uh, the measures uh, gives uh, more effect uh, and. Uh, we, uh, these are just three examples of three sites, sites like this, when we did some uh, analysis and we discover that in a different sites, the measures can be, uh, 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 the, the differences in the final effect uh, can be very different. This is the uh, example, maybe you can focus on this column, which uh, shows the class of uh, uh, it, it shows a class of the uh, hydromorphological degradation. Thank you. A class of hydromorphological degradation. So in, in, uh, uh, in the current situation, it was the uh, state was bad, the uh, class fifth, it's uh, a, a bad status. And we discovered that if we uh, introduce uh, 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 the full range of possible measures, we can we can get a very small improvement. So we we uh, improved from the bad into poor, uh, but uh, we we found several sections where we uh, discover that the effect can be much more dramatic. Like this example, when when we got a, a poor status uh, nowadays, and with uh, uh, analysis shows that we can reach uh, we can reach already good status, and we also can find. Uh, sites uh, in the river system when we can reach the uh, the uh, uh, very good status. Um, yeah, we we use the British system river habitat survey for the simulations, and also uh, uh, we can introduce uh, the uh, uh, hy hydraulic uh, uh, estimation on this uh, simulation, and we can so uh, using this approach we can select uh, sites where the uh, river restoration is the most effective and we also can control the uh, impact of a high water. We can control a risk of uh, flooding. So, uh, so uh, in the results of uh, our study, we could, uh, we could select uh, sites. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we could reduce uh, significantly uh, uh, measures to be uh, to be to be done uh, in in the first stage, uh, and we can uh, do all these spendings in the places where we can expect uh, the highest uh, improvement. Uh, and uh, the uh, the analysis proved that generally it was uh, additional result that generally uh, the risk of the flooding is is very very low. We we just uh, when we when we consider, consider uh, a possible measures we uh, we uh, calculated the roughness values for uh, new construction and you can see that uh, the impact. Uh, on high water is very low. Yeah, all these uh, measures we introduce, they react uh, uh, very strongly in a in a low water. But when the uh, water uh, is is high, they don't uh, disturb very much. Uh, that uh, that the rise of the high water level it is just ten centimeter in each case. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you for the introduction. I'm going to uh, briefly introduce my poster about monitor monitoring to the, during the construction phase of a restoration project at the Austrian Danube, enabling adaptive planning. Uh, here is the project reach. Uh, those of you who have been at the last year's uh, field trip know the reach and know the project because of, it was part of the field trip. It's the 48 kilometers long section between Vienna and Bratislava. It's a free-flowing section, and all the uh, things I will present are part of the pilot project, with it, which is near the municipality of Bad Altenburg. Uh, there are some problems in this river reach. There is the ongoing riverbed incision. Uh, there is a rather poor habitat structure. Uh, we have some critical spots for inland navigation. 
and uh, there is an unsustainable maintenance situation. And so the stakeholders agreed on some measures, and all these measures they agreed on were firstly uh, all together implemented in one reach, the project reach Badoch Altenburg, which was the optimization of the low flow water regulation. Uh, then 1.2 kilometers of riverbanks have been restored. A side arm has been re reconnected, and there was the innovative measure called granometric bed improvement, which was firstly uh, introduced in this project, uh, where more than 100,000 cubics of coarser gravel were uh, dumped in the section. The material is coarser than the mean grain size, but it's within the natural grain size spectrum. It should reduce the bed load uh, capa transport capacity, but not stop it entirely. So here are some pictures from the construction works, which uh, took place until uh, summer this year. Uh, and now I want to show some examples of the monitoring, starting with the multipoint beam uh, bathymetry analysis, which were very important for the analysis. Here you can see uh, differential plots over a period of three months. It starts again just a second. You can uh, see the dumping in red, you see the dredging in blue, uh, and then you see that materials, material moves in and uh, covers the granulometric bed improvement in this area. So this was a very uh, important methodology we used. Then we had the freeze core probes. Uh, there a steel pipe is rammed into the riverbed cooled down with liquid nitrogen, so the material freezes to the tube, can be lifted out, and with this method we could check uh, where the material is, so you can see the granul granulometric bed material here, so we can allocate the quantity and the uh, mixing depth. We also used radioacoustic pebble tracers, uh, they were damped together with the allowance material, so we, it was a first impression how the material behaves and when it starts to move. And uh, later on, when it started to move, we obtained the mean travel velocities and the resting periods. Another example, the bad forms. Bad forms were detected during the monitoring, uh, and they were found to highly influence the construction, construction phase and the bad load transport. So an intensive study was performed. There were uh, 16 measurements on one day uh, to follow these gravel dunes. And here you can see those gravel dunes move. Yeah, and with this high-resolution survey, it was also possible to follow uh, those gravel dunes and determine the, the velocity or the propagation velocity, which was found between 2.5 and 9 meters per hour, so at a very high rate. And we also followed the moving volumes, and we could uh, have a rough estimate on the bed load transport rate, which we compared to the measured bed load transport rate, and we found out that uh, the bed load transport is highly influenced on this uh, dune movement. So coming to my conclusions, from my point of view, monitoring is an essential tool, especially if we have an adaptive approach in a project. Uh, a combination of methodologies is always a good idea. Uh, it is, the monitoring is uh, important to obtain quick and direct information. Those fast-moving bad forms influence the construction phase and the bad load transport and the freeze core technique and the radioacoustic tracers uh, did a good job in uh, assessing the, uh, the method of the uh, granulometric bed improvement. So thanks to the contracting entities and the co-authors, and thank you for your attention, and come to my poster. <laughs> thank you, Marcel. The topic of, of my poster is related to soil bioengineering. In general, when we speak about soil bioengineering, so we, we use plants as living building construction material uh, for civil engineering purposes. And uh, soil bioengineering systems so cover a wide range of, of, of different uh, fields of application, so from soil, uh, from slow protection uh, up to re-greening measures uh, above the timber line, and also we use this kind of techniques uh, for river restoration work. This is nothing new, it's quite old, uh, as we see on this uh, slide, so on the left side when they, when they used 
uh, branches uh, to protect the uh, river banks against uh, erosion. Um, and yeah, so this was the past. Then it completely disappeared. Yeah, so this is on the left side uh, an example from when from from river engineering project from the 1950s. So generalizing uh, the river and the same section uh, 2006 later when we use, when we use soil bioengineering techniques. Uh, for river, restor river restoration work. <clears throat> Whenever we do uh, river restoration work and uh, use soil bioengineering techniques, so we have to take, uh, we can divide it into two main, main parts. So the, the, the first one, the biological one. Uh, so we have to know about, about uh, what kind of species we can use, what kind of species are uh, well adapted as, a, as, adapted as pioneer plant uh, character what kind of species are accordance with location. So it is always uh, necessary to do this kind of uh, assessments to choose the right uh, species. And on the other side, we also have to take into account hydromechanical uh, aspects, uh, especially for river restoration work, uh, bending uh, the, shape of the shape of the plants, uh, because they have an, an, yeah, we have, we have an uh, development of plants and we have to take into account also the discharge capacity, for example. I would like to introduce two, uh, two techniques. Uh, the first one, willow brush mattress, uh, we, we see on the, uh, we see on the, we see on the, on the, on the right side uh, a design. Uh, so a brush mattress, we, uh, we take branches uh, quite close, close together and to come up finally with a, with a, with a dense a carpet. Uh, uh, all of them are fixed with wooden bolts to the, to the ground. And uh, in this case, so we use as a basement, we use uh, hydraulic blocks. And so this is the result just after, after a, a few months, we sprouting uh, from, the, from, the, from the branches. The next one, or vegetative groin. So we, uh, we use it for slope stabilization work, for riverbank uh, protection, but also we, we can use it for, for restructuring uh, the river bed. So in this case, so uh, vegetate, vegetated groin, or we see the design uh, sketch. So short uh, vertical living uh, machines, uh, and on this slide, the, the wooden frame uh, structure where uh, the vertical machines are positioned, and this is the result after after resprouting, re so improving the, the aquatic uh, habitats. So. Coming up to my conclusion, so we can use soil bioengineering uh, techniques as appropriate uh, techniques to install near nature river sections. We have to take into account uh, biological properties and also must be able to, to have a local availability, easy propagation, and uh, all the species we use should be in, in accordance with the location. So specific conditions are mechanical and hydro hydrological and hydraulic effects, uh, effects uh, which you have to take uh, into account because we have a dynamic, it's not, a, it's not a, a conventional building material, we have a dynamic development and so it's quite, quite imp important to assess uh, these kind of uh, conditions. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Hans-Peter. So this may be the fastest <laughs> soil engineering presentation you'll ever see in your life. <laughs> but anyway, I'm here to talk to, for the case studies of soil bioengineering application river uh, restoration projects in southern Portugal. Uh, and I'll talk first on uh, Paul de Gosha, which is located in the middle uh, of uh, Portugal. It was a uh, former uh, use for sand and gravel extraction and then used as dump and debris deposit. So we used uh, a number of uh, bioengineer techniques. I'm just going to mention a few. And we've done a series of other work that I'm going to present tomorrow. But just this, this is just for the bioengineering techniques. So this is the live machines. Uh, you can see that it's slate. Uh, and here, this is the results. And this is the water fences. And this is uh, the results. And this is bush matrices. And as in the rest of Europe, you always end up with some uh, vandalism <laughs> occurring. Uh, 
this is planted coconut fever rolls, and these are the results. Uh, and now we'll see a little bit on the evolution of some of the techniques were used, but uh, also, so this is a little bit how it worked, the, the project. And now passing to uh, the southern part of Portugal, uh, in Algarve region, uh, and you have here a restoration area uh, in Odoloca River, which is a uh, crazy river, mainly because of the torrential um, uh, flow. So there are uh, seven reaches that were identified uh, mainly as a mitigation of the construction of a dam in the Natura 2000 uh, area where you have or you're supposed to have links, and then in, in as the, the compensation me uh, measurements, we also uh, um, had some reproduction, and it's going to be reintroduced in the next uh, months or so. Um, so this is the reservoir, and we have um, made the interventions. Oh. Uh, sorry. Well, in the middle. <laughs> section and sorry so here on here okay uh, so I'll uh, first uh, talk with uh, in the section F uh, we uh, have uh, majorly uh, Arundu Donax uh, removal and um, we applied to overlap geotextiles mats uh, and used um, live cuttings and also uh, rooted plants. Uh, this intervention didn't work, this is the reference, didn't work uh, very uh, well, although we had uh, used an anti-grass geotextile. Uh, it, it didn't work uh, with 100%, uh, percent. so this is the, the works and the introduction of uh, soil. And uh, again, uh, here in the Mediterranean, I think the, the major finding is that if you use uh, live cuttings, they don't uh, normally work as, uh, uh, as good as uh, rooted uh, plants. Uh, so this is in section GH. Uh, we used, um, um, we wanted to improve the habitat for fish, so we introduced some uh, islands, vegetated islands, uh, and this is the, the general view. This is the, well, a little unconsensus intervention anyway. So here again we had uh, invasive uh, species colonization. This uh, species has the ability to uh, completely um, remove a bridge. Uh, so here we had a uh, vegetated log uh, crib wall and we used uh, um, cuttings and we uh, from uh, salix and other species and we noticed that Nerion oleander and Tamarix africana had better results than salix and even uh, if you used uh, rooted plants the results are uh, better. And here we had um, a major um, uh, removal of uh, stones and planted uh, uh, riprap because it had no um, uh, riparian area and it was being colonized by uh, the invasive uh, species. So we removed it and then uh, applied this. And so this is the general overview. This is uh, a more um, hard solution with uh, vegetated hard uh, gabions. This is well, I personally would prefer that um, that we would have used given space to the river anyway. It's not possible. <laughs> it was not possible, so we decided to go for this uh, harder uh, technique. And so this is the reference, and this is these are the works. And here you can have you can see a negative for uh, willow plantation. This is just a detail of the execution phase. And then you can see also the results. So final remarks is that both project objectives will take some years to be totally achieved, but the conditions are set for a successful outcome. Groundwater levels and local population involvement are essential for technique success. And it is imperative to adapt existing bioengineer techniques to the Mediterranean reality. Even so, because we have uh, noticed that uh, if we even make some soil bioengineering um, 
uh, techniques application in, in shadow areas, you'll have much different results if you use the same type of material. So if you, some of you uh, would like to have some cooperation in this field of bioengineering techniques transfer from North and South, I'm completely available for that. So 39 slides. <laughs> And uh, I'm our last speaker, and uh, uh, I'm the, the only one, uh, only the presenter from outside of the Europe. And uh, as, uh, I'm a member of uh, Asia Liver Restoration Network, and we came to, to uh, contract the MOU with the ECALA, the main, as well as uh, are participating to this uh, good uh, uh, conference here. And so today, uh, I think that uh, five, uh, three minutes left to be finished, <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure to, to be on time. But I'd like to uh, say about the hydraulic impacts of the wetland along the submerged weir removal in the river estuary in, in Korea. The purpose of study is to analyze of the water stage change and downstream wetland influence along with and without the submerged weir in Han River in Korea, and to give the decision makers to the information, the hydraulic influence, so as to choose the alternatives of the preservation, uh, maintenance, and the improvement and removal or relocation of the weir. Okay. Let me introduce at first the, the Han River. So, uh, this is the this is the Han River from upstream to downstream, and uh, which is the biggest uh, uh, river in Korea. And it passes through the center of the Seoul metropolitan city, and it uh, confluent to the sea uh, in the downstreams here. And uh, we have a major uh, three obstacle uh, structures. So one is the, the dam of side uh, the, from uh, this point to uh, 40 kilometers. Uh, and there are two uh, submerged weirs uh, in, in those. Uh, yeah. And uh, the, at the end of the, the downstreams, uh, the submerged weir called the Shingok were, uh, built, was built in early uh, 80s for the purpose of water level maintenance and the protection from the seawater intrusion to upstreams. And it has two weir, the, the fixed weir and the movable weir. And the, the left side is, has a five, uh, five sluice gate movable weir, and the, the rest of the, the right side has a, the fixed weir. And uh, as a result of the construction of this weir, the huge wetland, as called Changhang, as sort of developed as a result of the weir construction. And this wetland, these wetlands are preparing for the registration of the Ramsar wetland. However, the recently the social conflicts of the weir removal occurred for the river rehabilitation ecosystems and and uh, recovered. So, and um, uh, every candidate of the uh, Seoul Metropolitan mayors uh, were uh, making issues of the removal or the maintenance. <clears throat> this is the cross section of the conceptual, and the, this is the, the, the downstream submerged weir, and this is the, uh, the upstream submerged weir. And the, when it flows the, in a flood, it um, it maintains more than 10 meters of depth, and, and high tide also as well. This uh, maintains more than uh, five meters, and uh, the fishes migrate uh, the, in uh, the usury of the, the these weirs. But the Seoul city government uh, prospect the water water level decreases in max five meters, uh, at least three meters between up and down submerged weir, which influenced the, the water navigation, the waterfront activity, and also salinity injury to upstream. Yeah, they are very worried about that kind of uh, problems, and uh, I analyze it. Uh, in terms of uh, the water levels and the salinity, you know, the water quality and the, the bed, bed deformations, and etc. And an unsteady analysis was carried out from, uh, from 
this point to uh, the uh, upstream uh, Pangtang Dam. Um, as a result of uh, the analyzing, this is the, the at present conditions of the, the simulation of river bed. The, the red spot is the deposition. So here is the wetland area, and uh, the blue or, or green is the erosion as well. So, okay. Sediment transfer tends to be affected by high the adverse tide rather than the discharge from the upstreams in, in dry seasons. But in, uh, in flood season, it tend to sediment transfer and deposits and move to downstream due to heavy flood, which causes to repeat erosion and deposits and repeat history. And also this is the, uh, the also the same case of uh, uh, the flood season in case of removal of wares. Okay, uh, now let's uh, consider about the impact of the wetlands. Uh, those greens are wetland area, and uh, the, in dry season, wetland is affected by the tides fluctuating from the 0 0.5 to 4.3 meters. The water level changes in the area of wetland causes typical characteristic of the brackish water zone. The, together with the tidal influences, showing ecosystem variety. But in case of submerged whale removal here, as you can see, the water level change reduces 1 to, uh, to 1, 1.5 meters due to the water level to arise, arise to, uh, due to the removal of in dry season. This might weaken the brackish function and also introduce salinity to the uh, upstreams. And, uh, the, uh, those two pictures are taken in uh, in the 2011 uh, when uh, it occurs a very big flood, more than uh, 27,000 uh, cubic meter per second okay, in July. And uh, this is uh, before the uh, the flood and after the flood. And it, this is the gray area is a transition area, but uh, those those are uh, the vegetation uh, area. So. If, if the big plus, it uh, transfers out uh, to the sea, but uh, usually in the uh, dry season, it deposits in this area. And also, uh, this is the, uh, the shape of the present of the wetland here. This is the, the transitions uh, in the muddy area, in the vegetation area. So, but if the wares removed, the, it, the, the area of the, the wetland will reduce the as a, of, uh, to, to uh, more than 20% as of uh, present conditions. But on the contrary, on, on the flood season, there is a little change so, because uh, uh, already the race up the, the water levels. So. Okay, so uh, this is my uh, result of my uh, research. In, uh, in case of submerged well removal, the water surface level uh, reduced one to one point five around the wetland since the water influence from the upstream it rises, and this might uh, weaken the breakage function and so also introduce the salinity to the upstream. Depending on the with and without submerged weir, dramatic changes can occur in not only ecosystem but also hydraulic condition in dry season, but not in a flood season. And if the weir is removed, the area of the wetland will reduce uh, um, about 40% uh, uh, of the total the wetland but uh, in, in vegetarian area is uh, five percent of the vegetarian area, and uh, uh, results of uh, biological research diverse the wetland of aquatic plant would be reduced in the land of vegetation area. The size of each population is just two, but the diverse of plant is prospected as similar as the current situation. The so. I think it's very difficult to decide to remove the, the submerged wear or not. All those things also should be considered comprehensive, such as hydraulic influence and environmental aspects, and as well as uh, socioeconomic conditions. Thank you.